What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode, I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Friday, in the third week of Lent, we continue on through the Gospel of Mark, following our Savior to the cross. We have, well, we have a, a writing from Philip Melanchthon from a document called Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope which is directly related to our reading from the Gospel of Mark. And of course, our Lenten Catechesis, continuing on with the fifth and sixth, or no, I'm sorry, yeah, the fifth and sixth petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Stick around. <laughs> So occasionally I, um, well, I'm, I'm not shy about the fact that I'm a Lutheran. And when the Roman Catholic Church has a tradition that is older than, than shall we say, um, the usurpation of the Bishop of Rome, then I will always advocate for it as a tradition that belongs to the Church Catholic, not to the Catholic Church. But I strive really never to just flat out... <clears throat> The Catholic Church, although I have done so um, in, in a recent uh, YouTube video regarding uh, COVID-19. Uh, I've kind of stuck it to the Roman Catholic Church a little bit, but just hear the words from the gospel, and then, yes, we will address the document on the power and primacy of the Pope, but let's focus on the words of the gospel, the promises of Christ, and then, yes, we'll deal with this whole Pope issue. So we begin in Mark chapter 10. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many." And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. A couple of thoughts on this. Jesus, this is the third time in the Gospel of Mark uh, that he's told his disciples that he is going to the cross, that he is going to be mocked, scourged, killed, but that he will rise again. And in complete obliviousness to this, Jesus, will you do us a favor? <laughs> and how many times has he told them 
you, you know, the, the, the first must be last. If you want to be great, you must be the servant of all. And what are they asking for? Well, let one of us sit at your right hand and on your left. And Jesus is like, when I come into my glory, there will be one at my right and one at my left. But not you. And there were, weren't there? There was a thief and a criminal on his right and on his left, wasn't there? when he came into his glory. Weird that we should consider that, Jesus coming into his glory, but that is exactly what it is. That is when the Son of Man was lifted up. But he also tells them, oh, you will, you will. And they were, weren't they? Persecuted and martyred for their confession of of who Christ is. But then Jesus again reminds them in tender love, that the first must be last. Don't be like the Gentiles who lord their leadership over their people. Mm. You lead by serving. And this then brings us into the writings of Philip Melanchthon from the treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope. One, Luke 22, 24 through 27. Christ clearly bans lordship among the apostles. This was the very question. When Christ spoke of his passion, the apostles were disputing over who should be the head of others and, as it were, the vicar of the absent Christ. Christ rebukes this error of the apostles and teaches that there shall be no lordship or superiority among them. Instead, the apostles will be sent forth as equals to the common ministry of the gospel. So he says, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. um, Yeah, so Luke 22, 25-26. The contrast here shows that lordship among the apostles is not approved. 2. Matthew 18, 2. When Christ, in the same dispute about the kingdom, places a little child in their midst, he is teaching the same thing by parable. Just as a child neither takes nor seeks sovereignty for himself, so this shows that there is not to be sovereignty among ministers. 3. John twenty twenty one, Christ sends forth his disciples in equality without any distinction. He says, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He says that he sends them individually in the same way he himself was sent, John twelve forty four through 50. Therefore, he grants no one a privilege or lordship over the rest. I'm just going to say it. The one who sits enthroned on the seat of the office of the Antichrist has declared himself the vicar of Christ on earth and the teachings, the raping of the gospel of free salvation. Not when the coin in the coffer rings, not through penitence and good works. No, 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 no. Not through purging of sin and purgatory. No, the free gift. And and at the Council of Trent, the anathematization of the gospel itself by the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, The office of Antichrist is held by the vicar of Christ on earth. Jesus does not condone lordship among those who would preach, but calls us to be humble servants of one another. This is for, yes, for pastors and for preachers and for ministers who hold varying offices and titles, but as far as lordship, as far as the ability to speak ex cathedra and therefore be infallible, bullshit. He swore, I know, I... I... (laughs) Bull hockey on that. There is to be no lordship among those who are called to preach. They are sent as servants, and for you and me, those of us who are, do not hold an office in the in, in the ministry, we are called to love and serve our neighbor, and not a one of us is above all. How dare we ask to be seated right next to Jesus on his right or on his left? That's not... The, the glory that Jesus was coming into was his cross and passion. Now, if we want, uh, in love and service to our neighbor, to suffer... 
on behalf of someone else is Jesus himself said, greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend of. That's, that's something. That's something. But to grant ourselves the authority to speak ex cathedra is bullcrap. Absolute bullcrap. But enough of this harsh teaching of Jesus. Let's get to something a little bit more friendly and a little bit more to be enjoyed. The Lenten Catechesis on the 5th and 6th Petitions. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There is here attached a necessary yet comforting addition as we forgive. Just as we daily sin much against God, and yet he forgives everything through grace, so we too must ever forgive our neighbor who does us injury, violence, and wrong. If, therefore, you do not forgive, then do not think that God forgives you, Matthew eighteen twenty three through 25 But if you forgive, you have this comfort and assurance, that you are forgiven in heaven. This is not because of your forgiving, for God forgives freely and without condition, out of pure grace because he has so promised as the gospel teaches. But God says this in order that he may establish forgiveness as our confirmation and assurance, as a sign alongside of the promise, which agrees with the prayer in Luke 6, 37. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. The sixth petition. And lead us not into temptation. Temptation is of three kinds, of the flesh, of the world, and of the devil. For we dwell in the flesh and carry the old Adam about our neck. The old Adam encourages us to have all kinds of evil lusts which cling to us by nature and to which we are moved by the society, the example, and what we hear and see of other people. The world offends us in word and deed. It drives us to anger and impatience. No one is willing to be the least. Everyone desires to sit at the hand of the group and at the head of the group and to be seen before all. The devil especially agitates matters that concern the conscience and spiritual affairs. He leads us to despise and discard both God's word and works. Lead us not into temptation refers to times when God gives us power and strength to resist the temptation. 1 Corinthians 10.13. However, the temptation is not taken away or removed. While we live in the flesh and have the devil around us, no one can escape his temptation and lures. It can only mean that we must endure trials indeed, be engulfed in them. 2 Timothy 2.3. But we say this prayer so that we may not fall and be drowned in them. We pray. O God, the helper of all who call on you, have mercy on us and give us eyes of faith to see your Son that we may follow him on the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.